the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul tells us to run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Of course, for most of us, Paul isn't encouraging us to run an actual race. But for Jesse Owens, <laughs> that's exactly what this passage meant. This month in history, in August 1936, Nazi soldiers lined the streets in Berlin, welcoming Olympic athletes from around the world. Some of those athletes, they deemed unfit to compete in their Olympic games. But Jesse Owens, a black American, stood on German soil as the United States' best representative to win the gold and upset Hitler's Aryan ideology. By Hitler's definition, Jesse Owens wasn't human. And maybe Hitler was right. Maybe Jesse Owens was superhuman. His athletic achievements were already legendary. During the 1935 Big Ten track meet in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Owens set three world records and tied one more, all in less than an hour. It's considered the greatest 45 minutes in sports history. Breaking four world records in a 70-minute span had put a target on the back of the Alabama native. Originally known as J.C., Owens was born in Oakville, Alabama in 1913. He was one of 10 children and the grandson of a former slave. As a kid, Jesse said that he was simply faster than all of his friends. At school, he was encouraged to take advantage of his natural talent and join the track team. Jesse first shocked the onlookers with his speed at the 1933 National High School Championships. He tied the world record in the 100-yard dash at 9.4 seconds. And when he went to college, he didn't slow down. As a part of the Ohio State University track team, he would soon win eight individual NCAA championships, earning him the name the Buckeye Bullet. Though Owens enjoyed athletic success, he had to live off campus with other African-American athletes. When he traveled with the team, Owens was restricted to eating at Blacks-only restaurants. He had to stay at Blacks-only hotels. Even though he was the greatest track athlete in the nation, because of his skin color, Owens did not receive a scholarship. In fact, he had to work part-time jobs to pay for his school. Owens achieved track and field immortality in a span of 45 minutes on May 25, 1935, during the Big Ten meet in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He equaled the world record for the 100-yard dash and set world records in the long jump, 220-yard sprint, and 220 low hurdles. It's considered one of the greatest athletic achievements in history. In 1936, Owens and his United States teammates sailed on the SS Manhattan and arrived in Germany to compete. At the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, his fame preceded him. Crowds of German fans cheered, where is Jesse? Just before the competitions, founder of Adidas athletic shoe company, Adi Dossler, visited Owens at the Olympic Village and persuaded him to wear the company's shoes. This was the first sponsorship for a male African-American athlete ever. Much to Hitler's dismay, Owens won the 100-meter dash with a time of 10.3 seconds. He won the 200-meter sprint with a time of 20.7 seconds, as well as the long jump with a leap of 8.06 meters, or 26 feet 5 inches. He would also win the 4 by 100 meter relay and capture a record four gold medals and was not equaled until Carl Lewis won gold medals in the same events at the 1984 Summer Olympics. He would later credit his long jump world record to advice that he gained from Luz Long, the German competitor whom he defeated. Luz would become a friend and Owens would eventually have a spiritual impact on the German. On August 1, 1936, Nazi Germany's leader Adolf Hitler shook hands with the German victors only and then left the stadium. International Olympic Committee President Henri de Bailly Latour insisted that Hitler greet every medalist or none at all. Hitler opted for the latter and skipped all further medal presentations. Hitler was subsequently accused of failing to acknowledge Owens or shake his hand, a common misconception. Even Hitler could not ignore his athletic greatness. 
Owens once said, Hitler had a certain time to come to the stadium and a certain time to leave. It happened that he had to leave before the victory ceremony after the 100 meters race began at 5.45 p.m. But before he left, I was on my way to a broadcast and passed near his box. He waved at me, and I waved back. In an article dated August 4, 1936, the African-American newspaper editor Robert L. Van describes witnessing Hitler salute Owens for having won gold in the 100-meter sprint. And then, wonder of wonders, I saw Herr Adolf Hitler salute this lad. I looked on with a heart which beat proudly as the lad who was crowned king of the 100 meters event get an ovation the like of which I have never heard before. Many athletes around the world were inspired by Owens. During a parade in New York City in his honor, Owens was handed a paper bag. Owens paid it little mind until the parade concluded. When he opened it up, he found the bag contained $10,000 in cash. President Franklin D. Roosevelt never invited Jesse Owens to the White House following his triumphs at the Olympic Games. When the Democrats bid for his support, Owens rejected their overtures. As a staunch Republican, he endorsed Alf Landon, Roosevelt's Republican opponent in the 1936 presidential race. Speaking at a Republican rally in Baltimore, Owens said, some people say Hitler snubbed me, but I tell you Hitler did not snub me. I'm not knocking the president. Remember, I am not a politician, but remember that the president did not send me a message of congratulations because people said he was too busy. Owens decided to capitalize on his success by taking advantage of endorsement deals. United States athletic officials did not like this. They withdrew his amateur status, which had the effect of ending his career immediately. Owens returned home from the 1936 Olympics with four gold medals and international fame, yet had difficulty finding work. He had to take on menial jobs as a gas station attendant, playground janitor, and a manager of a dry cleaner. He also raced against amateurs for cash. Owens was prohibited from making appearances at amateur sporting events, and his commercial offers were nearly dried up. In 1937, he briefly toured with a 12-piece jazz band under contract with Consolidated Artists. He made appearances at baseball games and other events until Willis Ward, a friend and former competitor, brought Owens to Detroit in 1942 to work for the Ford Motor Company as assistant personnel director. But as Jesse's athletic abilities faded, his faith did not. You see, Jesse's gifts weren't just on the field of competition but in his ability to share his faith with his athletic opponents. One account from the German long jumper Luz Long, whom Jesse defeated that August for the gold medal, tells of how Jesse's testimony changed his life. In a letter written by Luz Long, the German who gave advice to Owens while they were competing, talks about his newfound faith because of Owens' influence. The letter has profound significance due to the circumstances of its writing. During his time serving in World War II for the Nazis, Luce wrote Jesse. I am here, Jesse, where it seems there is only the dry sand and the wet blood. I do not fear so much for myself, my friend Jesse. I fear for my woman who is home and my young son Carl, who has never really known his father. My heart tells me, if I be honest with you, that this is the last letter I shall ever write. If it is so, I ask you something. It is a something so very important to me. It is you go to Germany when this war is done someday find my Carl and tell him about his father. Tell him, Jesse, what times were like when we were not separated by war. I am saying, tell him how things can be between men on this earth. If you do this something for me, this thing that I need the most to know will be done. I do something for you now. I tell you something I know you want to hear, and it is true. That hour in Berlin when I first spoke to you, when you had your knee upon the ground, I knew that you were in prayer. Then I not know how I know, but now I do. I know it is never by chance that we come together. I come to you that hour in 1936 for purpose more than Der Berliner Olympiade. And you, I believe, will read this letter while it should not be possible to reach you ever for purpose more even than our friendship. I believe this shall come about because I think now that God will make it come about. This is what I have to tell you, Jesse. I think I might believe in God. And I pray to him 
that even while it should not be possible for this to reach you ever, these words I write will still be read by you. Your brother, Luz. Luz was killed in action soon after in July of 1943. The letter reached Owens a year after it was sent. Jesse kept his promise to his friend. After the war, Owens traveled to Germany to meet Luz's son, Carl. He was a part of Carl's life and even served as his best man at his wedding. Owens traveled the world and spoke to companies such as the Ford Motor Company and stakeholders such as the United States Olympic Committee. In 1979, he was hospitalized with lung cancer. He died of the disease at age 66 in Tucson, Arizona on March 31st, 1980. Although Jimmy Carter had ignored Owens' request to cancel the Olympic boycott in Moscow, the president issued a tribute to Owens after he died. Perhaps no athlete better symbolized the human struggle against tyranny, poverty, and racial bigotry. Owens demonstrated how believers can answer the Apostle Paul's charge to hate what is evil and be devoted to one another in love. Those hot summer days in August, Jesse Owens could have responded to the evil around him with hate. Instead, Owens chose to live by faith and show love to a man who would later become his friend and eventually consider belief in God. <laughs>